So I wanted to, to start off with a uh, discussion of higher education, and I've got to talk later on today on energy economics. And hopefully I'll uh, um, be able to keep those two straight. Um, I've been teaching for, uh, I figure, about 25 years, maybe a little more. And um, I enjoy teaching thoroughly. But things have certainly changed in higher education since I started. And um, most of you are in higher education on the consumer side. And so I'm hoping this will be um, interesting to you. You've certainly noticed that the cost of higher education has gone up. That's one of the things I want to talk about um, this morning. And I, I, before I move on from my, my introductory slide here, I just want you to notice where college tuition is on uh, price, the price change trajectory here from the last 25 years or so. Um, the only thing that has, has exceeded the increase in the cost of college is hospital services, which I talked about yesterday in my medical care talk. Uh, and you'll notice that um, housing, college tuition, hospital services, um, child care and nursery school, all of these are areas where government has subsidized or is providing some of these services directly. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that we see some very high price increases in those areas. Last year, when I gave this talk, I had three crises to discuss. Now I have four, if that tells you uh, how things are going. Um, and I've rearranged this a little bit. But I want to talk first about um, ineffective teaching. And then uh, we'll talk about the enrollment cliff, which is a new one for this year. Um, I have not discussed that in the past. So um, I think there's a lot of very effective teaching in, going on in college, but there's a lot of ineffective teaching as well. And the incentives that we see are such that um, poor quality education, <clears throat> excuse me, poor quality education is becoming more and more common. Part of that is because of the incentives that professors face. And part of that is because of the way colleges are administered. Um, so what is, we, we need to think about exactly what it is that we're doing in college. Um, it's, it's very common to think of a college or university education as being one that is transferring useful skills to you. Um, at best, it's, it's the, the best conception we have of higher education is this, it's teaching people how to think, um, how to reason, um, maybe uh, some technological kinds of knowledge that are, that are coming along with that. Um, but basically enhancing what is commonly called a human capital. Another possibility is that college education is kind of a, a signal of your motivation, your, your willingness to persevere at a difficult task, at, at your uh, level of intelligence and, and capability. Um, maybe this is something that is, that is uh, useful because it signals to a future employer that you're a hardworking, capable individual who would make a good employee. And maybe it's less about the content of what is learned than the fact that you are willing and able to learn something. Uh, another possibility is that it's simply a consumption good. You go someplace for four years, and you have a good time, and occasionally you show up for classes because you need to be able to uh, maintain grades that are good enough for you to be able to stick around for the next year. Um, and there are certainly a lot of facilities on most campuses that are uh, intended to kind of cater to uh, students' um, enjoyment of their, their time there. Um, but we can see part of the, uh, part of the uh, uh, transition that we've seen in the last several decades in college education is toward higher and higher grades with less and less effort on the part of students. And so this is um, something I'll mention in a minute. But first, let me give you the, the case for higher education, as you'll see from, say, a, a high school guidance counselor or a, a, a lot of the uh, colleges will trumpet this kind of information about how much more you can earn if you are a college graduate as opposed to not being a college graduate. 
Um, and, and certainly we can see that if you have a college degree, you are more likely to be in a high income group. That's not really uh, new information. However, I think there's some um, confusion about this, maybe some misinterpretation. What we're lumping in here is not just recent college graduates, but people who are you know, baby boomers who have been around for a long time. They graduated from college in the 60s or 70s, and they, uh, they've been working for a long time. And when they graduated from college, going to college was not as common as it is today. So we're seeing some high earners there that may have been through the higher education system at a time when it looked very different from what it, it, it looks like today. Um, this uh, chart here, table, is from Richard Vedder's book, um, uh, Restoring the Promise, which I, um, I've got a review on that book on the uh, uh, QJAE, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics uh, website, if you're interested in more about that book. But he, um, he says, okay, so, so we, we see this, this very significant increase in, in earnings as you obtain more education. There's no real um, surprise there. So if you look at the median uh, uh, person with a, with a uh, bachelor's degree, uh, males are earning about $63,000 a year in 2016, uh, females about $41,000 a year. And if you had a high school diploma only, then that median is a lot lower, 33,500 for males, about 20,000 for females. And uh, that, um, that's a pretty significant income boost that appears to be correlated with more education. And then, of course, if you look at alternative investments, it, it looks like college is a great deal. Um, and it, I, let me be sure to clarify, this is a good deal for many students. I mean, it makes sense for many students to go to college. I'm not trying to say, oh, this is a racket for everybody and nobody should go to college and this is useless. I, and don't take that, that's not the takeaway I want you to get from this. I don't want to talk myself out of a career for one thing, but that's, <laughs> That's, uh, that, that's not the case. What we're seeing, however, is that there are, at the margin, there are people going to college for whom that payoff is not going to materialize. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the problems. People are, are accumulating student loan debt and they're absorbing four or five or six years of their time trying to get a degree that is not going to actually generate that kind of return. Um, so it, it really depends on who you are and what your, what your interests and capabilities might be. Um, Richard Vetter has pointed out that we, we are over-educating many people. So we've got um, about half uh, of the occupations that we see people in require a bachelor's degree, but a little over a third only require a high school diploma at best. Um, and about 11% require something more than high school, but maybe a two-year degree would have been sufficient. We see um, uh, many more people graduating from college than we have jobs that actually require a college education. So we've got, at least according to this, what is that, about 12 or 13 or 14 million people who are graduating with a college degree, but uh, we don't really have to have that level of education to take the kind of job that they will eventually get. And we can see how this has changed over time. So the, on this uh, uh, chart here, the black column is in 1970, the gray column is for 2010, and we've got about 15% um, today, oh, well, in 2010, we have 15% of uh, taxi drivers who uh, have a uh, college degree, whereas in 1970, it was a very, very tiny number of taxi. Why do you need a college degree to go to, to, to drive a taxi? Uh, same thing with shipping and receiving clerks, uh, salespeople, firefighters, carpenters, bank tellers. Uh, these are no, nothing against these jobs. I mean, we, we, we need people to do these things, but do they really need to spend four years of their life and at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, gaining that sheepskin um, in order to do those kinds of jobs. Now, 
if, if you've um, seen this talk before, you'll know about my little uh, pipeline diagram here. I'll just go through this very briefly. Um, if you've got the population here on the left, you've got the, the blue and the red are uh, two different kinds of people. So uh, you've got motivated, persevering, intelligent people, and then people that are not so motivated, persevering, or intelligent. They're kind of all mixed together in the population. So if you're in the population and you're motivated, persevering, and intelligent, you would like to be able to demonstrate that char those characteristics that you have to a potential employer. You'd like to be able to say, look, I, here's proof. I'm not just saying that I am motivated, persevering, intelligent. I actually am. And here, here's how I will show that. I will go through a four-year program that will test my motivation, perseverance, and intelligence. And then if I come out on the other side with a certificate, call it a degree, then you'll know I really am motivated, persevering, and intelligent. Doesn't matter uh, too much what the major is. Well, it, some majors require more motivation, persevering, and intelligence than, than others, right? So uh, this is why for example, Wall Street firms like to hire people with, uh, you know, like physics degrees and, 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 and engineering degrees. It's not that you need to know uh, the, um, you know, the curvature of a pipe and how much head loss there is in a, in a pump system in order to be able to trade stocks. But, uh, you know, if that person is willing to go through that very different uh, or very challenging um, program, they must have the kind of characteristics that you want for a demanding kind of occupation. So uh, people go through this filter. They put themselves through this in, in an effort to show what kind of person they are. Now, some people don't make it through the filter. They fail or they drop out. Not that dropping out is always uh, a sign of lack of motivation. I mean, Bill Gates dropped out, and he's a pretty motivated person. Um, and uh, then you've got people that just don't enter the filtering process as well. So. Some of those are motivated, persevering, and intelligent. They just didn't want to spend four years and a lot of money uh, going through the filter. Uh, but then you get people that are certified. And that would be more or less what we had in higher education prior to World War II, uh, prior to the GI Bill and huge amounts. Now, there were, there were government subsidies of higher education before World War II, but World War II and the GI Bill that came uh, later on really um, um, turned the system into a, uh, a system where we are, we are pushing more and more people into this, this kind of filtering process. And colleges and universities like money. They like to get more students coming in. If you could, colleges and universities can see every 18-year-old as someone with a backpack full of federal or state money. And the only way to get access to that federal or state money is to uh, admit this person into your, into your college or university. So with that additional incentive, that we get a lot more people trying to go through this filtering process and the college or university has incentives to um, extract as much from that person over the four year period as they, as they can. Uh, so the filter becomes less effective. It's not as, as useful for certification purposes. And we get a lot of people that kind of make it through that filter. They get their college degree, but it doesn't really mean as much as it might have at one point. And we get a kind of an arms race among people who are, uh, who are college, uh, who, who are seeking a certain kind of occupation and they want to be able to prove that they're motivated, persevering, and intelligent, but maybe the four-year degree isn't as effective at conveying that signal as it once was. So we have, for example, um, Brian Kaplan, who wrote a book called The Case Against Education. He uh, is a college professor as well. Um, you might think he's trying to self-sabotage his own career uh, in, in saying this, but he, he, you know, he says, look, um, uh, we're over-educating people. Um, he says, once workers have been ranked, giving everyone extra years of education is socially wasteful. And so we're probably underutilizing, he says, certain kinds of alternatives like apprenticeships, testing, boot camps, and so on. So he says, signaling, if you think of education as not so much the conveying of information to students, 
but as trying to prove that you are at the top of the stack in motivation, perseverance, and intelligence. He says signaling explains why students are more concerned about grades than about actual learning. Um, why, why it is that you, you um, uh, can take a test, kind of dump your knowledge onto this test and forget about it thereafter, and you're not too worried about what you've retained. Uh, signaling explains, he says, why cheating pays. A cheater is not really gaining the information, but the cheater is impersonating a student who is motivated, persevering, and intelligent, and carries the same degree at the end of the four years as anyone else. Um, so he says, look, we, we just need to stop educating uh, as much as we currently are, and the way to do that is to cut a government education spending. Um, it, at one point, you could make a decent living with a high school diploma. Uh, in a lot of occupations, that was perfectly sufficient. You could do, do um, uh, pretty well for yourself. But what we've had is a kind of credential inflation, which we probably need to, um, to counter with some credential deflation. Uh, you might be able to be a... If, you, if, you, if your objective is to be a, a retail sales clerk, then why go to college? I mean, you don't need that anymore if you had less money being uh, pumped into the education system. And then, too, there's, there's not a lot of evidence, apart from the occupational boost that you might get from a college degree, um, you could say, well, there's other things in college that are valuable apart from just preparing yourself for some chosen occupation. Um, but Kaplan says, look, there's, there's little sign that education is causing much enlightenment or civic understanding. Um, even at top schools, he says, most students are intellectually and culturally apathetic. Most professors are uninspiring. Um, not this crowd, of course, but that is, I mean, you've probably observed this if you're in higher ed among your fellow students. They, just a lot of apathy. Uh, they, they, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, they, they don't care and a lot of faculty are that way as well. Um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things about plagiarism, which is rampant. Uh, uh, it, it's all over the place. Um, administrators, uh, the admissions offices in, in colleges and universities are often incentivized to take students because, again, they come with that backpack full of federal and state money. Um, if the student can't write very well or doesn't have a lot of other requisite skills, um, well, maybe, maybe we can kind of shepherd this student through uh, with some additional help, but we don't really uh, need to have students who are adequately prepared, or at least we've got an incentive to accept students that are not, um, not very good at uh, basic college skills. And administrators as well, once the student gets into the higher education environment, um, the administrators don't have a whole lot of incentive to prosecute plagiarism. Faculty um, often are, I, well, I can, I can speak for myself, I, I get personally offended when students plagiarize, and so that kind of motivates me out of a sense of justice uh, to prosecute cases of plagiarism when I, when I see them. Um, but administration, mm, their incentives are a little different, I think. Uh, they do need to maintain the reputation of the school, but at the same time, there's a lot of incentive to kind of sweep things under the rug or at least make things so difficult for faculty to actually effectively prosecute uh, plagiarism that it is, it is uh, not done very often or not as often as it should be. AI is making this worse. Um, and it is, it is becoming a real problem. Uh, Faculty and administration are still trying to figure out how to handle a lot of this. It's a fairly new thing um, that, that, you know, chat GPT has been around for less than a year and we're still trying to navigate some of that. Um, so uh, Jonathan Newman, uh, who wrote an article for uh, Mises Wire um, uh, a few years ago on this, uh, the title was Four Reasons Why College Degrees Are Becoming Useless. Uh, he, he says that some of the most prestigious flagship universities' test results indicate that the average graduate shows little or no improvement in critical thinking over four years. Um, uh, grade inflation is 
largely responsible for the increased graduation rates that we have seen, and we are seeing higher graduation rates. I've had people tell me, well, that's because students are smarter now than they used to be, and that's why they're able to stick around for four years and not flunk out. Mm, I, I, no. Um, <laughs> So uh, one national survey found that 41% of students had GPAs of an A minus or higher in 2009 compared to 7% 40 years previously. Um, a 2022 study showed that the increase in graduation rates over the last three decades is driven by grade inflation. It's not that students are actually learning more or that they're more capable they are um, receiving higher grades with less effort. You can see um, the uh, grade distribution has become very much skewed toward A's and B's. Uh, D's and F's are, are rare. Um, I think a lot of this is because faculty don't give C's as much as they once did. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on faculty for, uh, to, to give students higher grades. And a lot of this, again, is tied back to government money. You know, in order to get my scholarship, I've got to maintain a GPA of X. And professor, if I don't get a grade of A or B or whatever in your class, I'm going to lose my scholarship. Well, no faculty member wants, I mean, if you've got a heart at all, you don't want to, you know, be responsible for the student having to leave college. I mean... Uh, so, yeah, okay, well, I mean, the student has a you know, 76, maybe I can fudge that a little bit and make that an 80 so the student doesn't have to flunk out. I mean, um, if you're uh, not relying on massive government funding of higher education, you know, you have students that are getting C's, but because they're more often, if they, if they were more often self-pay, you still get your degree, maybe your GPA is not a 3.0, but you graduated, and, um, and, and that's fine. Um, and it used to be this thing called the, the gentleman's C. I was reading a, bio, bio, a biography or something of Franklin Roosevelt, who apparently was not a stellar student. Um, uh, not really surprising, but I mean, he, he <laughs> I had to take a swipe at FDR, but, um, but you know, he was a kind of a C student and made it through, and, and uh, he apparently had other priorities or, or something. So uh, th that was at one point acceptable, and it was fine, and students weren't just um, uh, tormented by the thought of getting a C. Um, students are spending less time. Uh, I, I gave this talk a couple of years ago uh, where I showed this, um, this slide, and I had a student say, well, maybe, maybe this is because we have the Internet. And so because we have the internet and we don't have to go through card catalogs like you did back in the 80s, um, maybe we're able to just do research faster and we're able to type faster because we have computers as opposed to handwriting and typewriters and so forth. Uh, I, I was on the IT uh, committee at my college um, and I, I uh, talk to our IT or CI, CIO, I guess, the equivalent of the CIO. And um, years ago, I remember uh, talking to this person. He, he told me what the Internet usage was uh, among college students. And it is not research, <laughs> uh, predominantly. It, it should be, but it is predominantly other, other things, uh, video games, among other, other things. The second, um, so you know. All right, so, uh, so uh, the second crisis is um, the enrollment cliff. I was talking to Sean Rittenauer earlier this week, and he said, so you're, you're going to talk about the enrollment cliff, right? And I thought, oh, I guess I better. So I will. Um, so this is a, a phenomenon that's resulted from, from changes in birth rates. Um, we, as, as you know, the population of the United States and other countries fluctuates. Uh, we get, you know, the baby boom, and we get the baby bust, and then we get the millennials. And we, so um, I, I'm Gen X. I, I know you don't know what Gen X is because we always get forgotten. But we're in between the baby boomers and the millennials, and so we get to make fun of both uh, groups. Um, 
But we, we were a fairly small generation, and because Gen X, um, I'm, I'm 50 years old, so people my age, because we're small, the generation of our children, which I guess is Gen Z, yeah, uh, is also correspondingly small. Um, so what we're looking at is the prime college age student is getting scarcer in the U.S. population. So uh, I pulled this chart, um, I guess it was yesterday or the day before. What's today, the 27th? So yeah, yesterday. And uh, there's where we are, and we're looking at an increase in the number of 18-year-olds followed by, as you can see, just falling off a cliff. Um, so from around 9 million 18-year-olds uh, today to around 8 million in a few years. Um, so this, this is uh, sometimes called a population pyramid. It's not very pyramid-y in shape but it is the age uh, and sex distribution of the United States. And you can see here um, the, uh, the baby boomers are there in the orange, the millennials are there in the blue, um, I'm there in the, in the middle, uh, Gen X. And you can see that there's a, um, there's a, a, a narrowing of that population pyramid toward the bottom. Um, and that, this is for 2020, so this is three years old. Um, we, we see these age groups, of course, march upward on that pyramid. Mortality takes people out um, as we move upward. So right now the millennials are, I guess, the largest generation by number, but there aren't very many people behind that millennial generation. And so when this, uh, this uh, bottom gray section here reaches college age, uh, that is, we're gonna feel that. It, colleges and universities are not gonna have as many students. Now this, this it, it's kind of difficult to say that this is the fault of government per se, um, although government does um, affect demographics, but it is something that's going to push colleges and universities to do several things, one of which is to ease admissions requirements, another is going to be to uh, pursue more government funds to kind of shore up their finances and allow them to keep all of their various administration that they have been so eagerly hiring over the last uh, couple of decades. The effects of this are not going to be uniform across the United States. Um, this uh, shows that the, the, the red uh, are, and orange are where you're going to see the biggest enrollment declines. The blue are where you're going to see um, maybe slight increases. So the West Coast, uh, the Mountain States, and oddly enough, South Carolina, where I teach, um, are going to see some increases. Uh, but much of the country is going to really see some contraction in the number of students coming into colleges. Uh, so um, elite institutions are probably going to do better than um, regional four-year colleges and universities. So I don't think Harvard and Princeton and Yale are too worried about, about this. Um, according to uh, the article that I've cited there at the bottom of that slide, uh, regional bachelor's institutions are expected to lose more than 11% of their students by 2029. Um, and uh, a lot of that is um, affected by migration as people, you know, older populations maybe in the, in the New England states, younger populations maybe in the mountain states or California. So we're gonna see some differences across states, but a lot of colleges are not gonna make it through this. They're gonna fold. We've already seen some colleges that are, um, that are in trouble. They're in trouble financially, their enrollments are declining, and some of them are not gonna make it through to the other side by the time the children of the millennials make it into. And a lot of this cliff is connected to the recession of 2008, 2009. There's my connection. Who caused the recession of 2008, 2009? Okay, so the Fed, right? So the Fed actually has an impact on this. 
Uh, they create a recession, birth rates fall, uh, and then 18 years later, uh, you see a decline in college enrollments. Um, all kinds of events will affect birth rates. Um, I guess in 2038, admissions departments are going to be celebrating everywhere uh, as children born in, uh, in, in 2020 make it to college age. So uh, all kinds of economic events will have an impact on, on this kind of thing. Um, so again, I, I'm not sure where this is going to take us. It's going to be a difficult period for a lot of colleges. I'm a little concerned, maybe more than a little concerned, that colleges will water down their requirements even further in an effort to keep enrollment numbers up. Um, and that's, that could erode the credibility of college education even more. Well, that's not altogether a bad thing, though, is it? I mean. Uh, some colleges and universities need to have a, a uh, need to have their credibility taken down a couple of notches. Third is I wanted to talk about the, uh, the the stifled academic discourse that we've seen. This is a very widely discussed problem. A lot of this is not going to be new to you. You may have, may have seen some of this up close and personal in your own institutions, but we we've seen a, a lot of this kind of. Um, uh, uh, decline in the quality and the civility of uh, academic conversations. Um, one of the key responsibilities of an institution of higher education is to foster conversations that develop our understanding of the big concepts in our world. And when you can't have those conversations because someone is going to try to get you canceled for expressing an idea that might be controversial, then it's, it's uh, going to diminish the quality of the entire enterprise. So you, some of these episodes are very uh, famous. Uh, unfortunately, these have become so common that they're even episodes that would have made their way into the news six or eight years ago are, are uh, kind of commonplace today. And, uh, so you, you get student protests where they take over classrooms and prevent any kind of uh, educational process from going forward. Um, students invading administrative offices and, and disrupting classes. Uh, some colleges have um, struggled to figure out how to deal with this. Unfortunately, it seems that there are a lot of schools where students believe that their protest uh, is a way to um, signal their dedication to um, certain values uh, that they they believe will are, are popular among their their peers and uh, the more you protest the more uh, credibility you get among um, your your favored group um, in a 2017 study of college students uh, many students said that shouting down speakers and using violence is sometimes acceptable. 90% of college students say it is never acceptable to use violence to prevent someone from speaking. Well, that's great. But 10% say it's sometimes acceptable. And you don't need that many to create a pretty serious problem. Uh, a majority say, 62% said that shouting down speakers is never acceptable, but 37% believe it is sometimes acceptable. Um, and students, I, it, I'm sure I'll have some conversations with some of you afterward, but some students are aware that if, if, I, ha if I talk about X or Y or Z, then I, I could wind up with, uh, I, I could be attacked on social media, I could be ostracized, I could, uh, my you know, faculty might go after me in some way. I, I, um, talk to students who say, well, you know, I, I'm in, in this class where I can't say certain things because I know that the, the professor is uh, very much opposed to that, and so I just want to get my grade and get out of there, so I keep my head down and I don't have a discussion. Uh, so this is, this is, um, this is a, a, a real, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a damaging thing. It's, it's, it's killing um, the quality of, of academic uh, discourse. In a 27, another 2017 study that polled 1,500 U.S. undergraduates at four-year colleges, 
fewer than half of the respondents believe that the First Amendment protects hate speech. Now, what is hate speech is a whole conversation we could have. I mean, whoever gets to define that is in a pretty powerful position. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, a public university invites a very controversial speaker to an on-campus event. The speaker is known for making offensive and hurtful statements. A student group opposed to the speaker uses violence to prevent the speaker from speaking. Do you agree or disagree that the student group's actions are acceptable? 19%, about one out of five, believe that, that, was, that, that that's appropriate. Again, it, it, yes, it's a minority, but it doesn't take that many to disrupt a, um, a, what could potentially be an educational event. Uh, professors, of course, have been targeted and canceled and forced out uh, over some of these kinds of um, uh, making statements which many student groups find to be um, unacceptable. Um, so we need to think about that as we, as we kind of push back against that, uh, that, that tide of, um, of, uh, of anti-intellectualism uh, on college campuses. And I, I think a lot of us would support the, the idea that we need to be able to discuss issues even that if I have a conversation with someone who is saying something that I adamantly disagree with, I can still learn from that conversation. Um, College is not about someone presenting you with a set of ideas and saying these are the ideas you must accept and go forth with your degree saying that you've memorized our talking points. And we're supposed to be able to, to learn how to, how to think carefully and analytically about um, many things. And to do that effectively, we need to be able to have a conversation with someone who, uh, with whom we disagree um, and do so civil, in, in a civil manner. Um, and, and that loss of civility, I think, is, a, is, is damaging. It causes faculty to be self-censoring, as it does students. So um, there are conversations that I might have been willing to have with a classroom of students 20 years ago that I won't, I won't touch today um, because I, I like my job. Uh, and, and I've watched other faculty um, who, uh, I'm not necessarily saying at, at my institution, but I've seen faculty that have been, that have been uh, uh, persecuted uh, very unpleasantly for their, their statements, even if, even if the statement was objectively true or, or um, useful for academic um, purposes, it, it still is not, not um, welcome. Uh, another study here, this is from June 2022. If a professor says something that students find offensive, should that professor be reported to the university? And most students said yes. Uh, now, that's, what, what's offensive? Um, that's a minefield for a lot of, a lot of faculty. Um, and we, we're, we're trying to be able to, to have a conversation without, uh, among the students in the classroom without, without stepping on someone's offensive, uh, uh, offense prone sensibilities and, um, and, and triggering a visit to the, uh, to the provost office and possibly um, some really unpleasant consequences. So um, it's interesting to me that uh, if, you, if you look at the distribution of responses to this, uh, the left, the political left, seems to be much more willing to report faculty for um, uh, saying something offensive than conservative students, but even co among conservative students, they still um, a, a majority believe that that, that response is appropriate. Um, these kinds of events, this, this kind of uh, um, stifling of discourse is made worse by a growing bureaucracy in the university. Uh, these this is a, it's a, it's a, a rapidly growing segment of higher education. Uh, student bodies 
um, the growth of a student body is far outpaced by the growth of higher education administrators. Um, uh, deans and associate deans and deanlets and administroids and various <laughs> other people that are um, doing something, it's not always clear how, that con how it contributes to the mission of the, um, of the institution, although it's, it's certainly if you ask them, they'll say that their role is, is vital. A lot of this may be related to um, additional regulation placed on higher education by government. Uh, that, has, that has increased uh, substantially. But in the effort to justify your position in a higher education administration, you're, you're going to um, create work for um, yourself. Uh, so as, um, as we've observed in several high-profile cases, uh, even baseless accusations against faculty can lead to long investigations that often don't have due process. There's some kind of internal uh, kangaroo court involved. Um, so this is great for a university bureaucracy because it allows them to justify their own existence and see how many cases we had to deal with last year. Our workload is heavy. We need to hire more people to do our, our, uh, our, our work, which is so vital. Um, and, but it creates enormous stress. Even if you're completely innocent and you have, uh, you're eventually going to be uh, acquitted or something from this, um, this charge of creating offense, uh, it still creates enormous stress, which some faculty say, well, you know, I, my health can't take this or I'm just not willing to deal with this for the, uh, for the amount of pay that I'm getting here, so I'm just, I'm out. And so that, that is a, an increasing risk. Sometimes some of the most effective faculty are some of the most polarizing. They're getting people to think, and they sometimes do that with some provocative statements. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of shock value to kind of wake people up and say, well, wait, uh, I don't think I agree with that, um, but now my brain is working and I want to figure out why I don't agree with that. And maybe in that process of figuring out why you, you think that that professor is wrong, you're developing an analytical skill, which is valuable beyond the rightness or wrongness of whatever was said. That's important. But some of those effective faculty are being driven out because uh, they, are, um, they are offending uh, students. I don't have uh, more than a couple minutes here, but I, I will just briefly mention the last crisis here. The government is driving up tuition. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot said about student loan debt. Uh, there's a huge amount of it. Um, it is, interestingly, held mostly by people who have upper middle class or high uh, uh, upper class incomes. 60% uh, is held by those in the top 40% of household income. Um, now, that's, that's um, people maybe have gone to school for a long time. They went to law school or med school or something. They've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt. 92% um, of that is federal, and there's uh, almost $30,000 of average debt per borrower. We have seen tuition go up very rapidly compared to the rest of uh, the prices in the economy, and it has become less affordable. Despite all of this additional money going into higher education from government, higher education is taking a larger and larger fraction of median household income. So it's not like, well, we're pu uh, pumping a lot of money into higher education in order to make it more affordable for individuals. And the reason that this is happening is something that was observed many decades ago, that if you pump a lot of government money into higher education, colleges and universities say, great, that backpack full of government money just got bigger. We're going to raise our tuition so we can grab more of it. And that's called the Bennett hypothesis. Uh, we've seen a lot of this kind of uh, evidence that colleges and universities are raising tuitions, not exactly in lockstep with the increase in government subsidies, but uh, that is a large part of it. Uh, Tax-based aid to students is crowding out institutional aid. In other words, the institution says, well, we don't have to give you as much of a, a scholarship out of our own funds because you're coming in with all of these government funds that are making it more affordable 
for you. Um, if you're interested, I've got some studies that I can show you on this uh, that I had, had planned to go through if I have time, but I think the main point has been made. I, unfortunately, I don't have time for questions and answers now, but uh, I'll be happy to talk with anybody at lunch or afterward if, you're, if you want more. Thank you very much.